Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this Records Managers Forum um, on this Wednesday afternoon. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, we have quite a number of people uh, with us this afternoon, and it's always good to see uh, how popular the Records Managers uh, Forum, uh, particularly in an online environment, um, are. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Martin Killian. I'm the Executive Director of State Records New South Wales and also the Director of Collections within Museums of History uh, New South Wales. Uh, I'd like to start by acknowledging traditional owners of the lands on which we're severally meeting this afternoon. Uh, for me, it's Gadigal people being in the Sydney CBD and pay respects to elders past, present and emerging. Uh, and by all means, if you would like to pop in uh, to the chat, uh, the First Nations country from which you're joining us uh, this afternoon, uh, that would be appreciated. This afternoon, uh, we do have our usual forum of having a guest speaker and a number of um, uh, updates from both State Records New South Wales and also Museums of History New South Wales. But before we do that, uh, just a few housekeeping matters, a few up, a few uh, matters to, to make the session uh, run as smoothly as possible. So your cameras and your microphones have been disabled. Um, so do be aware that the forum is being recorded. Uh, so I trust that that's OK with everyone. So in case you're uh, put your camera on, uh, bearing in mind that you will be a part of that recording. Um, the speakers uh, will manually mute their uh, microphones when they're not presenting, um, but there are a number of people from both State Records New South Wales and Museums of History New South Wales in the background uh, this afternoon, helping us to, to run the forum, which is over around 200 people who've uh, responded to that. So the recording of the forum will be published on our website. Uh, so those of you who perhaps are representing organisations uh, that have colleagues within your organisations who aren't able to attend, uh, that recording will be available on the State Records website um, within a few days. Uh, there will be opportunity to ask questions uh, and we're asking for you to do so using the chat function. Um, of teams uh, rather than necessarily muting and unmuting microphones. So anyone who has a question or a comment, uh, please do so using the chat function. And as I said, one of us will either answer that question in the chat uh, itself or respond to the comment or um, we'll field that question through to um, any of our presenters uh, throughout the, the afternoon. Can I have the next slide, please? So our agenda this afternoon, uh, I'm very pleased to welcome our colleague Dan Rolink from the Department of Customer Service, uh, who will provide us with an overview of artificial intelligence, opportunities and challenges, and I'll come to Dan in a moment. Um, we're then going to hear uh, an update on where we're at with the State Records New South Wales Record Keeping Monitoring Exercise, and that will be presented by Catherine Robinson, uh, one of our two senior advisors within State Records New South Wales. Uh, Christy Tabiri, who's our Senior Advisor within Agency Services of Museums of History in New South Wales, uh, will then provide us with an update on amendments uh, to the State Records Act. These aren't new amendments. Uh, I'm hoping that you all already know about those, uh, but uh, this is to let you know where we're at in terms of implementing the provisions which have changed and came into force at the beginning of this year in relation to the State Records Act. Stephen Powter, our Manager of State Records, will then be providing us with updates uh, from State Records. And finally, uh, we'll have our question and answer session and uh, we'll then wrap up uh, the forum. But uh, this is a forum that traditionally um, is only as good as the participation. So I do encourage you to ask questions, uh, make comments as we go along. Uh, I'd now like to introduce uh, Dan Rolink, who's the Director of Digital Strategy and Architecture within the Department of Customer Service. Uh, we provided, we, we asked Dan uh, and invited Dan to come along here this afternoon, knowing uh, that artificial intelligence, A, is a part of our lives, B, will be an increasing part of our lives, and C, potentially has uh, record keeping implications. So as part of our uh, efforts to keep you updated with 
uh, things that are happening uh, within the New South Wales government space, uh, we've asked Dan to come along to provide us with that overview of AI. Um, so Dan, I might hand over to you and um, we will wrangle questions and comments uh, from uh, as you go along, if you don't mind. Over to you. Excellent. Thanks, Martin. All right. Um, yeah, thanks for having me here today. Um, it's good to be able to come in and give you an update of some of the things that we're doing in regards to AI. And um, you can see there from the title of uh, a snapshot of AI in New South Wales government. I'm going to focus on um, where we're at in managing risk around AI and what that looks like and to give you an indication of where we're going, where we're heading in regards to managing risk and some of the contemporary thinking around how that might transition from something that, that feels like it's something special to something that's just going to be um, business as usual in the future. Um, the, the first point I think is really important to, to cover is just the definition of AI. And I, you could have, um, you could take half an hour just talking about the definition of AI because there's so many different perspectives of what AI is. And it's, it's really part of the problem that I want to talk through today is, um, you know, at the moment when we think about risk, uh, there is a need to consciously um, be aware that you, you're, you're using AI and that that's part of some of the challenges that we have um, as it's been built into everything that we use. But the definition there is from the Digital New South Wales website uh, where, you know, AI is, it's, is effectively a computer system that can perform tasks um, typically associated with human intelligence. And that's learning, reasoning, um, creativity and decision making. And there's some examples down the bottom there of the slide. So. You may not be aware that you're using that you have been using AI for you know the last 10 or 20 years. You know, email spam filtering, um, web browsers, for instance, search capabilities, um, even this video video call and the noise cancellation features that that sit behind the uh, the algorithms that run so that you can hear me better and they don't hear the noise around me. Like all of that is using AI. And then the things that I suppose that we think about today around you know when we hear the term AI and why there's so much focus on it right now is what's been referred to as generative AI or gen AI tools. And I'll cover that in a minute, but that's, I'm sure you would have heard about it or at least, um, and possibly even use it. And that's the chatbot tools. So open AI, chat GPT is the main um, example of that one. Uh, so AI is in everything. Um, we've been using it for a while. The, the new thing um, is generative AI. It does introduce some new risks which is why um, there's been a focus on you know, evaluating our risk framework around AI and, and thinking about where we need to head um, with that framework. So I just, I thought it'd be good to extend on just the general use cases and use of AI into some specific examples. And there's a list there and there's, I think um, AI within New South Wales government, there's there's lots of activity and, and it is in place and it is being used. So like I said, it's not, not a new thing. Um, the new bit is the generative AI and the chatbot um, capability. And, and a simple way to think about that is um, when OpenAI released ChatGPT, um, it was really the first time that all of us that weren't you know, technical people could have a conversation with a machine using our nat natural language. And that's a very powerful um, um, shift in terms of how we can uh, use AI technology. Uh, the New South Wales EduChat is one particular example I wanted to highlight. You've probably seen it in the news. Um, if you haven't, um, you know, it's they've got some great information online. So they, they've rolled out a capability where they've got a chatbot and it's designed to um, respond to questions related to schooling and education. And they've deployed it in a way that it's, you know, responsible and transparent and safe. So they have certain filtering in the product that they've deployed. Um, so they can filter out, um, you know, language that shouldn't be used, um, any restrictions of top topics. The other really good thing about uh, this example and this trial that they're running across 16 schools is that if you, you know, if as a student, if you ask it to write you an essay, which you can do in like the publicly available um, equivalent chatbot tools. So the one that um, uh, New South Wales education system has developed and is trial in, if you ask them to, if you ask the, the chatbot to write you an essay, it comes back and it prompts you questions and it does it in a way that that um, in, in, you know takes you through a process of critical thinking. Um, so it's actually really uh, a powerful tool to help with educating an education system. So the if you go online, you'll find this a lot of information around EduChat and. Um, the way in which they're communicating very transparently of how it's been used, the way that they're really clearly explaining how they've been responsible, ethical, they're ensuring that there's transparency, 
the, the safeguards in place, how they've made that publicly available and communicate that online is exactly what we need to be doing when we're using um, generative AI within government. And that is written within the current AI assurance framework, which I'll come to in a minute. So I think the, the key point here is, um, you know, as, as we start to use um, AI tools, um, ensuring that we'd be really, really transparent about that use, enabling um, you know, the people that may be impacted from that use to be aware that it's been used, to have a say, to be able to raise concern and for us to be able to address those concerns is a really important thing to have in place. So when you think about a bigger picture, and again, you'll hear there's a lot of hype around this area, and I just wanted to cover um, some background to why there's hype there. One of the key things around the hype is just the potential economic opportunity there is with generative AI. And you can see on the right hand side there a report um, from Microsoft and the Tech Council um, where they did some modeling and they forecast that generative AI could, could contribute as much as $45 billion annually to the Australian economy by 2030. And that's a, their conservative modeling. Um, it could be as much as $115 billion. So you know, the actual economic potential from this um, new use of AI is significant. It's not a small um, contribution to the GDP. And, and it goes as far as um, contributing to the pressures that we have around our stalling productivity in the state um, where we've got decline in real wage, wages. So, um, and that's a position that's been supported through the Productivity Commissioner as well. So strong awareness that, you know, there's a, a real opportunity here with this technology and there's a lot of conversation um, in regular around how do we legislate or regulate to, to ensure that we're safely using this technology but there's also equally as part of that conversation um, we need to make sure that we're able to innovate um, and attract and grow businesses in this space because of the, that potential economic value that it brings so i think that's a, like a bit of a broader picture um, you know it kind of is a reason why there's so much hype around this technology as well as the the risk and, and um, issues that um, this new technology brings so the, the pro is the economic opportunity the the focus is getting the balance right with um, legislation and the implement, implementation of that through regulation uh, there's lots of um, countries that are leading or taking different approaches to this um, so the eu is probably the most recognized one um, where they're actually going through a process of implementing new law around AI. Um, and there is some definitely concerns, even with the countries as part of the EU, that that's a little bit too restrictive, like it does maybe not get the balance with innovation, right? And they're really concerned that it's going to hamper their ability to maximise the potential economic value um, through the legislation the law that they're bringing through under the EU. So for us, we've got to monitor understand and learn from what's happening but there's always as you do with legislation at the commonwealth and state level there's a there's a process we have to go through to really work out what makes sense for um australia and and for our states so there's definitely a lot of new challenges that have come through with this type of technology and you can see there just a couple of ex examples that I'll, I'll talk through you you probably have seen or heard of this the, the this this term of deep fakes um so that the ability to basically copy someone's um, image, you can now copy someone's voice, you can generate and create video of someone. Um, and that's called that's effectively called a deep fake if you're doing that without their their um, approval and you're doing it that in a way in which you you know benefit or it has a negative impact on them. So deep fakes is a serious issue and there's no one solution yet. There's different legislation being introduced to different countries that deal with it. But it's it's very complex. Like it involves, you know, um, having to um, coordinate between government and industry and you know, social platforms. It involves new technology of innovation um, that's been rolled out to help us identify if an image is actually where it's been generated. Then there's all these tools and teams and processes to be able to trace. Once we, um, you know, have something that we can identify the source, you need to be able to trace that back to who originated it. There's lots and lots of complexity around this issue of deepfakes, but it's definitely something that's um, a focus um, and needs to be thought through um, at the state level and the Commonwealth in the coordination that's happening at the moment. Um, deepfake also, and there's another good example there recently, you might have heard with the US election that's in um, um, happening this year, there was a robot call from Joe Biden who urged the New Hampshire residents not to cast ballots in a democratic primary and and 
um, and to wait and hold their vote because there's something more important coming up. That was Joe Biden's voice. It sounded exactly like him um, and it was complete deep fake. So it was just generated off the tools that we have. Now, these tools are available. I can go online and record my voice and, you know, I could just type in the prompt here and you wouldn't know it's not me talking right now. So it's, it's, the, it's the technology is that good. Um, if I played that next to my, if I spoke and played, you know, the, the, that fake version to the version I have as I talk, you do pick it up. So there's a little bit of warmth in my voice that you won't get through um, you know, how these tools generate um, and replicate my voice. Uh, but for instance, my wife or my kids would have no idea if if someone used those tools and and to call them up and was just typing away. So you can understand, you know, how that can put at risk not just democracy, but there's a lot of um, concerns around safety and what that means uh, for communities. The last example there, which is um, from the US courts, and this is the, probably the, the the most common area that you'll hear um, concerns around AI is, you know, bias, um, you know, it could be gender or, or eth ethnics, uh, religious. So these these platforms are um, basically built off really big data sets, and if you don't put the right controls in place, and if you don't, if you're not really careful with it, then the the bias of that data comes through. Um, so the US courts use this product called Compass, um, Compass, sorry, um, and that was given twice as many false positives for black reoffenders compared to white reoffenders. So it was meant to predict who's going to reoffend, and it was, um, you know, get um, incorrectly um, targeting um, a particular race in terms of who could reoffend because you know the model wasn't accurate and you know with the data that was built on. So there's some real examples that are that are happening. This is not something that's coming in that's happening right now. And there's lots of different things that are required to be in place to appropriately respond to this. So you can understand it's quite a complex and um, sort of space that we're in right right now and the timing around it because the technology is moving so quickly. Um, on the left there, there's a few other, I suppose, points around challenges that that are that are there. And creative industries is is one that's kind of um, has a lot of uh, folks at the moment for the right reasons. So um, the same company that released the chat GPT have released a new product um, and you can prompt and it basically creates a, um, a almost like a movie, really high definition quality and it's um, pretty hard to, to to tell the difference between that and you know someone going out and spending a million dollars on a, on a movie set and, and creating a movie. Um, that's not available at the moment, but again, it's just starting to show this how quickly this technology is moving and, and the types of things we can be doing. And it really, I mean, I've got three kids and I'm constantly looking at this technology and trying to understand as I'm sitting down at the table with them, what does it mean for them when they finish school or you know even um, and go into the workforce? What is that going to, going to look like with all these new technologies? And like any in a, like major innovation um, disruption of technology, some jobs will probably change quite a bit. There'll be there'll definitely be a lot, a lot of new jobs created. Um, and I think for us within government, our role is to ensure two two things. Within government, we're, we're safe and responsible in terms of how we use this. And, and there's a lot to that. It's, it's a small statement, but there's a lot to it. But also our role in um, legislation and regulation. So we have, have obviously a role to ensure that the use of this technology is, is safe um, and responsible um, in the private sector and to anyone within Australia. So it's um, the creative industries is another area that and you now that goes also into intellectual property rights. Um, so you would have seen again a lot of legal cases come up uh, where you know, these these systems that are built and trained off big data sets. They've used data off the internet and they've, they've used um, um, content that's under copyright law and and they're starting to then um, go through um, have legal cases against those organisations that have used that information. The state security, of, um, so these systems are very powerful. You, you can get a sense through hopefully what I'm saying and, and, and some examples I'm giving you just how powerful they are. Um, so we have to think about, you know, what does that mean in terms of cyber security, the new threats it might have, and there's the threats that come through to this technology, but there's also the, the opportunity to use this technology to counter existing threats or even new threats that could come through. But like any new technology or any new risk, we really need to think about, you know, where are we um, protecting our most vulnerable? Uh, you know, are we being ethical? Are we, we ensuring that our, you know, critical infrastructure and, and, and state assets are, are secure and safe? It's, it's 
all of these considerations are normal, I think, for any sort of disruptive technology. It's, the interesting point here is, um, you know, exactly what is this new technology and how do we establish all of those different safeguards um, when it is quite a broad potential impact area. So a few challenges to go then, I'd like to, I'm, I'm a bit of a, um, I like to think about the pros and cons of any technology. And, uh, and you know, we can, we use AI today, like I said, um, there is ways in which you can do it and you can be safe about it. There are some things you don't want to be doing and there's some things that are okay to do. And that's very much what the AI assurance framework is about, is providing that guidance. And I'll, I'll talk to that in a minute. But there's one more one more bit to this, um, you know, painting the, the challenge. And that's, that's really around um, just how prevalent AI is. So in November 2022, and I've already referenced OpenAI, the chat GPT, and pretty sure most of you would have used this already. And if it's open and available on your web browser, you can just go and have a play if you haven't had a chance to use it. Um, don't, with, there's guideline on, on this, by the way. So look at the New South Wales guideline if you're going to go and look at this and use these tools. Just generally, like even if you're not in, in government and you're using these tools, just consider it to be completely open and any information you get through it from it, just consider it to be um, a source of information. But it, it um, for instance, I never really trust anything that comes back from these tools. I'm always referencing and cross-checking as you would do, ensuring that you've you've applied due diligence in how you might use the information. Um, that's my personal use within government. Again, you can use these tools. There's a guideline on 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 um, that you can look at, which I'll show at the end of the end of this um, session. To, to give you some guidance of what you should and shouldn't be doing. But it's just, just consider it public, no sensitive information in there. You've got to, you know, you can use it to um, create templates and ideas. Um, you can use it to summarize public content, um, but you've just got to um, know what you're working with in terms of the tooling that it provides. So that tool was provided in November 2022. Um, and then where we are today with that tool, um, this is how rapidly it's grown. There's about 3 million customized versions of that product. What that means is if you've got a license to, to, you know, to get more capability of that product, you can create multiple versions and customize them to, extend, to an extent. So just off that one product, there's 3 million at the moment in place. Um, there's also a store, so that, that same organization has created a, like an Apple store. It's one just for ChatGPT. And they also have plenty of plugins. So there's all these other products and, and um, applications being built on top of ChatGPT. So straight away you can see like this is just one product and the extent in which it's been used. And then the consideration for us within public sector is, you know, um, you know, if we're starting to try to think about identifying and ensuring that we be careful with AI, um, that's the extent that's been used off one product. Uh, if you think about the other products that are available. Um, GPT, and I'm not going to get going into the technical um, definitions of things, but the equivalent of that that foundational model or the, that technology, there's probably another hundred of those that exist at the moment, and they all have their own ecosystems and own applications and, open, and everything else. And then what's happening is like our vendors, the products we use in enterprise, like Microsoft and Oracle and SAP, they're starting to integrate you know, all these types of capabilities into their products. So. In summary, there's lots of activity. AI is starting to get, and the particular journey of AI is starting to be embedded in everything, and it's starting to come into the tools that we actually use within business. So the obvious question is, like, when AI is actually starting to be in everything, then how can we ensure we, um, you know, we've been safe and responsible in that use? Um, which is probably the big question that a lot of people have been ta trying to tackle when we think about how do we particularly from a, from the service that we provide from DCS, how do we start to guide or provide information to help agencies, you know, be responsible and, and, and to deal with this huge complexity where, you know, AI is starting to be built into everything, particularly generative AI, um, when I'm referring to that particular um, challenge with the information I've provided. So <clears throat> this wasn't explained to me um, at all, really, and it's just because I've, I've been researching and in, in, in this space for a while that I, I do understand it. I don't think it's really clear to a lot of people why people keep on referring to ethics when, when we're talking about journey of AI. When, you, when you've when you got really com complex, integrated use of a technology all over the place, it's very hard for you to, you know, um, try to identify the, if that technology is embedded or used in the product. 
Um, so as the technology is evolving, changing so quickly, we need a way in which we can make sure that you know we've been ethical. And that's why um, when you look at a lot of the leading um, assurance practices on, on AI at the moment, they really their foundation is off an ethic, ethics principles approach. So ethics um, in terms of machine sharing, we, you know, we're fair, we've been transparent, um, you know, we're able to we're accountable for the decisions we're making. We're, you know, if we can't explain how the model generates something. Um, you know, still our accountability to be able to make a decision if we're going to use that information. All of those ethical principles really connect well with the problem space of, of AI and generative AI because it's driven by data. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of unknowns. There's things we can't explain because the technology is just too 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 complicated, and that's the experts as well. There's there's things that these tools can provide as information or decisions, and um, not even the experts can explain how it derived that decision um, or that advice. So, you know, the, an ethics-based approach allows us to really stay focused on you know, what are the things that are really important that we have to mitigate risk around. Um, irrelevant of how all this technology changes, let's just be really focused on, on the key points, and that's ethics. So all the leading um, sort of assurance practices around the globe at the, currently are fo focus and anchor um, around an ethics-based approach. So these print, the way it works is there's the principles here, they then break out into a, a list of questions. You run those questions against you know, your use case, how using you're looking to use the technology. And then from that, then you can determine the risk levels and, and what you need to be doing to reduce that risk. So within the New South Wales Assurance Framework, that's very much what we have done as well. So it's following that leading global best practice. Ian, the, um, Ian Offerman um, developed this and we were the first or one of the first countries to, to have it, an AI assurance framework. So that was in March 2022. He, he has left government, but he, he did a great job of, of updating to a version, uh, the later version of the assurance framework just before he left. And we're, we're looking at the moment to, to take that forward. So we're consulting and going through a cabinet process to get a new version um, agreed, and, and then we'll make that available. But at, at a high level, this is the process that's within the framework. You, um, you know, you work out if you, you think you know think you're using AI there's some sort of level of AI or understanding of what you're doing then you run through a questionnaire which is really around the business and the ethical issues and it gives you risk profiles and it gives you advice and things that you should be doing and then once you run that depending on the risk level you, you'd seek advice from an expert at the moment we have in New South Wales government what's referred to as the AI review committee so this framework is 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 run and if you have a residual risk so once you've applied your mitigation controls, if you still have um, 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 a high risk, then you go through to the AI review committee. Now, this is, has been mandated for agencies to use since March 2022, um, and you know that mandate hasn't changed, so it's still in place. Now, the the question I suppose is, you know, painted that picture of the complexity around the, the technology, technology of AI. You can see here straight away that um, you know we still have to have an understanding that are you using AI, and with the framework itself tries to provide examples and it tries to give you example business functions, so it's easy for you not to have to be a technical expert to understand am I using AI. So it, it's mitigating you know bridging a little bit between having to understand if you're in, using AI, but providing other factors to consider to help you realize if you need to run the framework. But where we want to head through, where we want to take it forward is um, you really want to get rid of that technology definition, am I using AI? And you really want, want to then think through and have a set of questions on any digital solution. That means that, you know, it, when it's embedded in everything, you're not going to, you, you, um, you're applying the consideration for any digital solution, yes, and it just embeds the consideration and the questions that you would have in AI. Depending on the things you would check, um, you'd always forward through to a technology expert group and depending again, on the requirement, it might go through to a specialized AI review group. So this is kind of where we um, see it heading um, into the future. At the moment, it is the previous slide, but in the future, we want to, as much as possible, just make it a, as simple for a business or anyone to run a set of questions for it to be, then be reviewed and validated by experts and then go through to, again, more specialized experts as a result of that. Um, we can only do that if we start to think about our suppliers as well. They provide a lot of services. So we're working with the procurement team at the moment around a guideline around, um, you know, how do we actually procure services and think about AI and, and what those questions should be. Uh, and 
So that's another key point to make. Um, we're, we're doing it at the moment, and then in the future, you'd apply again, just this general sort of questionnaire to the business. So the, the reason why we're not doing this right now, because the question is, well, why don't we just jump to that? Um, there's a few points to talk through on, on that. Oh, where is that? Sorry. So back here um, on, on the first point, we have to work to establish these controls and procurement. Um, so that's in progress at the moment, which is good. So we're kind of moving towards this more sort of um, broader model where we also, um, you know, managing risk as we procure services from suppliers. There's a, there's a need of, in the capability to even ask and answer simple questions. So your ability to answer these questions where you're not just forwarding everything through and putting huge demand on your CIO or your data groups, you know, this is different depending on the size of your agency, um, but you don't want every single solution and risk to just to flow through because you'd have to pay and scale out this function quite big. So there's a need to educate and and for us to trial and, and understand exactly how um, the business can run this set of questions and be um, educated enough that it comes through so there's not huge demand on you know the, the resources they're reviewing and supporting um, you know um, the risk around a digital solution. So that's that's um, one of the key reasons I suppose why we're not deploying it straight away. The other thing is we do need to build agency capability. So. There is a need to understand AI here within agencies, um, and you know it's still pretty new generative AI, and it has you know really effectively blown up in terms of its adoption across all the different te technology and product lines. So we we need um, to have the model we do at the moment, so we continue to upskill and build this capability across government. It is there in some agencies, by the way. Um, it's not like it doesn't exist, but we do need to strengthen that before we move to this type of model, where it's business general evaluation you know, agencies sort of technology check and then the agencies through the technology expertise can, you know, revert to experts. Um, this particular model I'm showing you is not something that I've seen yet um, in, in, you know, what's happening around the globe. So also we need to test and refine and learn from this. But where we are right now today is the right place, yeah. So we've got an assurance framework. Um, you do need to um, run that with the right skills within organization and that's defining in the framework who can fill it out once that's done depending on the risk level you know we can support going to an AR review committee um, and it also through as you run it'll it'll tell you what the le different legislation requirements you need to comply with so records management example is a need of running that assurance framework any sort of decision of that needs to be recorded um, and compliant um, to the Re uh, records act there's other legislation that's that's built into the tool as well. So it covers off, you know, privacy and information protection, um, you know, health records. Um, you give uh, it covers all the different components that you need to be thinking about in terms of managing that information. Um, so I'm just conscious of time, and uh, I had to. I would have liked to speak to those a little bit longer, but I did want to leave leave a bit of time for questions. Just in terms of resources, I have mentioned the assurance framework. This is version one. It's online um, and available off Digital New South Wales website. So you can Google it, you can go and find it, and you can download it. Um, like I said, it, it defines the, the types of people who can run it. You still have to have a certain level of, of um, capability to run this assurance framework. And that's just at a higher level. You need someone that understands data and data governance for you know what, how you, the data that you're using. Um, you'll need to have someone that understands the technology and the solution. And you'll need like a, an executive within the business that's kind of responsible for how this could be deployed and used within your agency. So they're the key roles you need to run the assurance framework, and that's not changing with the new version um, that we're we're looking to publish. Other resources that are there that I've, that I've mentioned, and again, this is very much around uplifting capability, capability and awareness. There's a, there's lots of free um, courses online these days, but um, we try to pull the key things together and make it freely available, which is what these are. So simplify definitions. Again, if you wanted to start to understand the language used, we've we've taken leading standards and we've, we've created um, a little uh, sort of a layperson's uh, definition of it. It does get a bit technical, but we try to make it more accessible. Uh, leading standards, by the way, we definitely advocate for. Um, you do have to pay for leading standards, so I'm not a big fan of that because it straight away limits their their accessibility to anyone that wants to understand this stuff, which is why we try to provide this level of guidance. But we definitely do advocate for standards if you're an engineer if you're looking to implement these technologies. 
generative AI, that's the chatbots, things you should or shouldn't be doing. If you want to do get better results, there's the prompt essentials and there's a cyber security um, focus as well guideline that's there. Um, moving forward, there's plenty of work happening. Um, um, so the left here is that um, on the guide, the framework that we've got, the new version, we're looking to work with agencies and understand how we can um, turn that into a guideline so it's easier for them to, to use within their own assurance practices. So that's something that we've mobilised and started working on now. Procurement guideline I mentioned. So, you know, the moment we don't have specific procure, procurement guidance for this technology and some of the, the additional considerations. So the team are working on that at the moment and that'll be built in and linked into the new um, assurance framework that's that's um, you know, uh, will be released. AI solution patterns are getting a bit technical, but I do run a cross department technology group and there's lots of different ways in which you can use this technology. And pat at a high level, pattern means that you can understand the type of solution that's been provided and then you can um, link that through the typical types of risks and considerations based on the technology that's been that you're selecting. So again, this this just helps this broader sort of suite of managing risk. Uh, we do have an AI discussion pack that we're drafting. So we um, we engaged across all departments at the end of last year and the industry and academia got some really good feedback and advice and papers and, and references around what New South Wales needs to be thinking about and what the priorities are. So we're, we're, we're working on that at the moment um, and looking to turn into something in which we can socialise um, and drive conversation around, you know, where do we head with the broader consideration of AI within government. And there's a national AI assurance framework that's happening at the moment. So um, New South Wales actually partnered with um, DTA and Commonwealth and the AI assurance framework that I, I referenced before is um, being used as a basis for a national framework. Um, so that's in progress at the moment. There should be a national framework um, of AI available around June is the date. Um, so that is it. I think I'm close to time. I don't know if I've left enough time for, oh yeah, I should have left enough time for questions, I think. Martin? Uh, thanks very much, Dan. Yeah, there are a number of questions and comments, um, but first of all, thank you very much uh, for that presentation. I can see from the, the response, uh, and the comments and questions that we have had, um, that that was very much appreciated. So fantastic, thank you. Um, before I open that up, uh, I, I did take particular note of your slide around the ethics-based approach and noted uh, the GIPA Act as being one of the sort of legislative instruments uh, within that. Uh, and of course, it is part of the, the family of information uh, uh, policy framework within New South Wales and, and of course I would advocate for inclusion of the State Records Act uh, yeah. uh, in that as well. So yeah. Yeah. Um, look forward to further discussions. Uh, and that's, your, Martin, that's actually, that. that's, that is in there, so it's a, it is a requirement. Um, yeah, it, okay. Yep. There's, so there's really? lot, there is actually a lot of legislation regulation referenced and even standards with the updated version, there's um, it's almost too much. Like we've got hundreds of standards and reference that are that were in the appendix of the current draft version, the latest one, and yeah. we are reviewing that to be a bit more targeted because you know you can get lost in in obviously you need something that's practical in terms of reference and managing risk. Yeah. Um, so we are we are looking to review that to be a bit more targeted within running the assurance around the specific standards that relate to particular considerations. Um, yeah. But at least from a from a legislative perspective of state and commonwealth. Um, as far as I'm aware, the core ones are captured within the framework. Yeah, great. Fantastic. Um, look, the, there was a core question around whether State Records New South Wales itself had a position or statement um, on AI. Uh, that has been answered uh, uh, by one of the, the State Records New South Wales staff, and the short answer is uh, not yet, but we're working on it. Um, and there's been referrals there uh, for everyone in, uh, if you'd like to direct your attention to the chat, uh, to colleagues in the Public Record Office of Victoria, uh, Queensland State Archives, Archives New Zealand and so on. Um, so that uh, if you're after sort of broad principles around that, um, until uh, State Records New South Wales has its own statement, that will provide you with some very useful um, background information. Um, Dan, a question for you around, is there a community of practice uh, from Dart.NSW that can help us or improve organisational capability uh, in respect of AI? Yeah, so um, just a bit of background in Opperman um, leaving government in December um, and then there's been a transition on 
from within DCS of that framework across into digital New South Wales. Our, our focus and, and since the transitions occurred is, is really just to get into the detail of the, the latest version and start to engage across departments to understand um, you know, where they're at in terms of the consult consultation around that. Um, we do, we are reviewing and, and uh, some of the functions that support the AI assurance framework. So there's an AI review committee which contains experts, um, industry experts uh, that can provide advice. You know, once you've run the assurance framework, for example, if it's if it's a high, still in it, it's still a high risk after you run it, you can consult with them. As part of that review or that group, we are thinking about the broader, you know, structural support around this, and that's um, so that's in consideration at the moment. There's no, we don't, there is no sort of standard even like last year before it came across into our area. There isn't a, a group at the moment that's sort of is sitting there supporting. Um, you know, adoption of and managing of AI uh, uh, assurance framework into the to agencies' risks frameworks, mm -hmm. but that's our intention around the guideline that I'm mo I've just started commencing mobilising the team around. Like we we do want to engage and understand how departments are currently doing this and where there are where where we can learn from them that may not be in our current framework, but also how we can um, take their feedback and and approve a guideline. The intention of doing that is not just to you know release the new version of the framework. The intention is that we can start to um, move towards having something that's easy for people to pick up and integrate into their own risk frameworks. Like the, the strategic direction for this, the ambition around it is it becomes normal part of risk management. It shouldn't be anything that's particularly different. Um, it does need to be different at the moment because there's just an upskilling requirement and this, you know, we need to get that uh, those skills within different parts of, of the agencies. And there'll always be a need for additional support services, but all of that is still too early for us to have a position around that. But we definitely, with the guideline and consultation, we will be um, um, understanding exactly what it, what is the need and what that could look like. So it's a bit of work work to do in that space. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, I guess in a sort of similar vein, um, there's a question around whether one of the sort of controls recommended would be an ethics committee for organisations implementing AI. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, no, that's ethics committees is a uh, within the framework team from reference at the moment that you know you could based on certain questions that they, they actually their recommendation is to to speak to an ethics committee. Um, I've been in the role two. I've, I suppose I had the framework for two. I haven't operationalized it or run it yet, so I don't like in terms of being talking to the other departments and understanding you know, exactly how they're using that as part of the guideline work. So. I don't actually know who's what ethics groups are established across government. I'm really interested to get out there and, and see and understand. Um, so again, that again, I think uh, what 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 I, what I can safely say is there's going to be functions that are required that aren't don't exist in smaller agencies, and we're going to have to work out a way to provide access to those services. Like that's that's typical for even what we do today in digital. So um, the complexity comes down to what we all know is like how who pays for that, how do you fund it, how do you cost recover. You know, there's there's all of those elements. So there's a if you need to stand up a new function to support where something may not exist because of an agency side or size or whatever other reason, um, the complexity typically comes down to funding. But hopefully for us at the moment, um, yeah, um, we'll get out there. We'll get the guideline. I think just in terms of trying to understand what things look like and how this progress in. Once we get the guideline done um, and published, and we should have a draft version shared between departments. Hopefully in about three three months, three to four months, depends on mm -hmm. the consultation. Um, but that should start to even shape. So as a guideline, we should we'll be able to start to answer some of these questions. You know, you, you do need these functions established in your agency. Um, you know, these are the ones that we're aware of that you could leverage, or you know, this is potentially a strategic opportunity that we have to elevate within government. Like we have to establish something new because there's a, there's a gap and a need of that. Um, but until yeah, so definitely definitely um, ethics groups uh, are required. They're sort of an evaluation of ethics. Um, it's one of the core functions that are needed to to assure the use of AI. Yeah, um, look, there's a, a few questions which kind of go to the very nature of sort of the framework and so on, such as, um, you know, whether digital is going to provide any guidelines on security or um, I think you touched on around procurement. Um, yep. Will the framework provide use cases or information for sectors where AI ought not to be used, such as potentially health decision making and so on? Yeah, yeah, it it does. The framework, like as you run through it, it does have like certain questions you might answer. It'll it'll, it'll um, say that you need to pause your project because the potential harm 
of that not being addressed is too significant. So depending on, and it is use case specific, so you can't, it's the, that's what frameworks are, yeah. So framework is providing that general structure in which you need to still understand your business context and still make the decision with your business whether that that implementing that is um, going to be a higher risk or a lower risk to what you currently have. I think that's a really key point to make as well. A lot of the things you see, even in the, in the media or conversations, they focus on use cases and say, oh, it's, it's terrible, it's not getting things completely right, it's causing these problems. Um, we've, we've, we've got to be a bit um, uh, broad, broader in our thinking around um, when that's raised because any solution that's brought in that's going to improve or reduce risk and you know, and potentially um, reduce harm that's created is better than not doing. So there's always this question around, well, what what is what does it look like if you're not doing that, and what are the options, um, other options or technology options you might have looked at. So I think it's really important to always think about, um, particularly when you're looking to to use AI or embed AI, or if you're hearing about AI use cases, um, we've got to educate ourselves and start to be a bit more um, uh, informed around. You know, not just looking at the isolated risk of an AI, but thinking about the risk of not doing is a really important consideration. Again, that that's is, is a business decision that we don't. The framework itself doesn't dissolve responsibilities that exist today, but we have capability with all the, with all the agencies and departments to assess digital solutions and and accountability with the business how they use those and the information that exists. Like it's not that's not a problem that we're trying to solve because that already exists. What we're trying to solve is trying to understand well what are the additional functions or, or different considerations to this particular technology and how do we start to embed that in what we already have across yeah. governments um yeah. it's it's an interesting point because um you know we we have heard uh you know some people suggest or even infer that there needs to be some sort of central group doing this but that does not make sense like government is so big um yeah. you know we need to leverage the capabilities we have we just need to understand the gaps and it's the same with legislation um and that's the that's um most of the countries around the world are approaching legislation in this way. They're not looking to create legislation for AI. They're looking to understand the gaps of the existing legislation, like through scenarios of this technology. Can our legislation cater for it? And if it can't, can we amend the current legislation, or is there something so unique about this that we need to think about something new? So that that is a similar similar approach. We need to look at what we have, um, grow from that, and not try to create something new around this technology, because there'll be another disruptive technology. You know after this um whether yeah. that's quantum because quantum's moving seems to be moving a little bit these days so there'll be a, next we need a, a scalable sustainable model for new technology being introduced to the government yeah i i think the and i might just make this our final question for this session but i think angela's question is possibly not dissimilar to that um where she's commented that a, a lot of capability is overseas um so you know uh her agency is using data or source code to build this functionality where the records are being stored and how do we guide the opportunities to explore versus obligations so yeah um, yeah yeah no i think i think the incentivizing and supporting trials of this technology and is, is a really critical part of us um edu not educating ourselves as well like if we don't have that opportunity to trial with, with this new technology and do that in a safe way, then it's hard for us to get informed around it. And that flows on to all the decisions of what we do if we're in a regulatory function or, or you know, if we're providing services to communities or we're supporting people that provide those services. Um, you know, we all benefit from that, getting access to trial these and, and understand what the technology is. The Digital Restart Fund is um, focused on, um, and if you're not familiar with that fund, you can look on Digital New South Wales website. But, there's a review around prioritising and allocation of of the, the digital restart fund towards that type of trialing, where you know we can um, look to fund and um, support through, you know, the networks that we have and the different frameworks to do that safely. Um, you know, trialing this type of technology um, to understand it, but also to to benefit from it and implement it. And there's concepts of sandboxes, and um, sorry, I'm not I'm probably just conscious of the time, but. Uh, sandboxes is a, a really um, um, good way in which we can be thinking about how do we start to trial these technologies in a safe way because the concept of it is really that you you've got a very controlled environment um, you know you you're um, mitigating any potential harms or unknowns through that controlled environment but you can actually test these concepts with customers you can you can evolve the regulatory bodies to so they can um, build out effective regulation 
through trialing of the you know the solutions and the technology that's there. So I think the concept of sandboxing is definitely an opportunity um, that you know we would advocate for when you're thinking about innovation, and you know the need to continue to fund and support people, um, get access to technology and the skills, um, you know, and being able to um, know the process they can run uh, to trial this is is a really important part of you know how we move forward. Yeah. Um, Dan, look, I think that we might leave it there. Um, but again, just to reiterate our thanks uh, to you for your time this afternoon. Uh, as I said, uh, well, there we have AI generated applause um, uh, for your presentation going off all over the screen. So thank you very much uh, for your presentation. Uh, this is an area that we inevitably uh, will hear more about. Um, and we'll learn more about. And I think this has been a really great uh, session for our, our records managers forum attendees. So thank you very much. Thanks, Pam. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, if we can move along with our presentation this afternoon. So I'd now like to introduce Catherine Robinson. Uh, Catherine, of course, is well known to many of you here at the forum. Uh, as one of our senior advisors within state records and Catherine will be providing us with an update on the record keeping monitoring exercise. Catherine, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Um, and I'd like to wish everybody a uh, good afternoon. I'm speaking to you from Gadigal country. Um, now, for many of you, you'll be aware that the annual record keeping monitoring exercise has started. Um, and as a reminder, the State Records Act requires each public office to report on its records management program. The record keeping monitoring exercise enables your organisation to meet this obligation in the State Records Act. The focus for this year's exercise is to obtain an overview of the level of maturity and conformity of public office records management. In simple terms, we're looking to see if there's been any changes in how well the jurisdiction meets its obligations under the State Records Act. I'd also add that the um, assessment of your organisation's records management um, also provides extremely useful information for your organisation on its record keeping maturity and conformity and identifies the opportunities for um, improvement. The information you provide to us gives us a snapshot of the state of records management in New South Wales, and that also helps us to um, plan and develop the resources that um, are being needed by public officers. The record keeping monitoring exercise runs for five weeks, um, and the closing date is Friday the 5th of April 2024. Um, could I have the next slide, please? Okay. So each public office is being asked to make an assessment of records management using the RMAT or the Records Management Assessment Tool. The RMAT is available for download from the State Records website, and it's based on the requirements in the State Records Act. There's 19 questions in total for you to answer. Um, with each question in the RMAT, you need to identify the level of maturity. So make sure you identify the information or evidence you've used to support or justify the selection of the maturity level you choose in your assessment. Um, public officers are also encouraged to provide comments um, in their assessment, which also provide um, context to the answers you're providing. The information you collect as part of your RMAT assessment is then um, collated into the online assessment form. I would note that the identification of relevant evidence is an important part of this self-assessment process. This is an evidence-based assessment, so there is an expectation that there is evidence to support the level of maturity that you've chosen. Um, including information about evidence is important for when you're pre presenting your assessment to your audit and risk committee or discussing it with an internal auditor or another interested party who may want to understand why you chose a particular level of maturity for your assessment. Um, when reviewing the assessment responses, State Records also looks at the types of evidence that have been um, identified and the information that's been provided by the public office. This information helps us to uh, understand and identify what you're using to support your responses, but also what kinds of challenges are being faced by public officers in um, their improvements of uh, records management and record keeping. And you'll see this reflected in the state of record keeping report for this year. 
we'll be once again reviewing comments and responses again um, and um, including relevant information as part of our reporting on the 2024 record keeping monitoring exercise. So all I would ask is when you review the five levels of maturity for each question, please make sure you choose the level which accurately reflects the current state of practice, not a future state. Remember, if you've not achieved everything that's in that scope or the definition for the maturity level, um, then we would ask that you accept the lower level of maturity. I'd also stress that level three is the baseline compliance level and indicates that you meet the requirement. Levels four and five indicate that the organisation has gone beyond meeting the compliance requirement and is achieving a higher level of performance or innovation in the topic area. Could I have the next slide, please? I wanted to remind all public officers that there has been a change to question 19 to reflect the recent changes to the State Records Act, um, which came into effect at the beginning of this year. There are five new levels of maturity for question 19. So please make sure you download the February 2024 RMAT um, as this will have the correct version of the five maturity levels and these will be the maturity levels you'll see when you go to complete the online assessment form. Um, so now I'm just going to take you through a very quick mini tour of the service portal. Apologies to those who've been using the service portal already, um, but this is for those who may, this may be their first time getting into the service portal. So when you um, log into the service portal, this is the screen you'll see. The assessment box, which is circled with red, is the one you need for the records management, uh, the record keeping monitoring exercise. When you click that um, assessment box, this is what you'll be taken to. It shows you a list of assessments for your organisation. So um, I'm showing you a screen that is a real screen for the State Records Authority New South Wales. And as you can see, we've completed the RMAT 2022, RMAT 2023, and we now have a create button for 2024. So when you hit the create um, button in your um, assessment response screen, that will take you to your brand new assessment form ready for you to complete. Um, okay, so this is what the assessment form looks like. At the very top of the form, you'll see information about the organization. Um, if you're a government agency, department or authority, it will identify what cluster you are. And for every, every entity um, covered by the State Records Act, it will identify what kind of public office you are, what sector you belong to. Um, we ask some basic information at the beginning of the assessment form, which guides us to um, put some context around the answers that you're providing. So the questions about budget and size of your organisation just give us a picture of how things are in particular size or particular resourced um, public offices. Um, on the right hand side, you'll see um, a column called steps. And this is actually a progress bar. So as you work through the assessment form, it takes you down each step. So there's a step there for all of the 19 questions. Okay, so if you haven't seen an assessment form before, this is basically what it looks like. It's fairly straightforward. So you'll get the question, um, and here I'm showing you the question seven on capability and capacity. You're offered the five levels of maturity for this question. You just need to select which one is appropriate. Then as you can see, there's a box for your comments and a, block, a box below for identifying the evidence that you have used for your um, choice of maturity level. And on the far right side, you can see how you've progressed through the various questions on the steps or progress bar. Then when you get to the end of question 19, when you scroll down, you will see this magic statement which says you're finished. So please make sure you click the submit button. Um, if you hit cancel, it will completely remove all your answers. So please make sure you hit the submit button and that's it, you've lodged your assessment. Um, when you go back to your main screen under the assessment box, you'll be able to then go and download a copy of your assessment for your records. Okay, so the results of the record keeping monitoring exercise are going to be available to you in the first quarter of the next financial year. Um, just like this year, we'll publish a report on our website and also in our annual report. Then we will um, uh, publish 
um, reports to public officers on their participation in the actual record keeping monitoring exercise. Like last year, um, we will also list those public officers that didn't make a submission to the monitoring exercise. Now, I've included a link to this uh, the 2023 um, record keeping report. If you haven't already seen it, um, please have a look. Um, and lastly, if you have any queries about the monitoring exercise or you're having any difficulties, please get in, in touch with us at the GovRec at staterecords.nsw.gov.au email um, and we will be very happy to help you. Um, are there any questions? Um, Catherine, there is one question from Kay in the chat um, asking when agencies will be able to upload the tool instead of having to manually answer the questions in the portal. Um, at this point in time, that's not actually in our development um, process. Um, so I'm sorry, but I don't have an answer for you on that um, at this point in time. Yeah, we certainly don't have any uh, short term plans for that. Pay. Um, having developed the developed the system and, and invested uh, in where we're at, at to date, uh, that would possibly be a future in uh, enhancement, but not not immediately. Um, there's a question. Uh, Jill has her hand up. Jill, are you able to unmute yourself? Or if uh, behind the scenes we can unmute Jill, please. Anyone? Uh, Jill, in the meantime, are you able to type in your comment or question? Oh, okay. Am I here? Can you oh, hear me now? Yes. Yes, indeed. Ah, it's weird. Right. Um, Thanks, no, Jill. I was just saying, just to let you know, I, I was actually in the portal and um, it wasn't loading for me. That when the create, when I got through to create to be able to right. do my submission, yeah. Okay, um, Jill, you might be experiencing a technical glitch. Um, could you send us a, a <laughs> okay. which we, we were anticipating this might happen. Um, so could you send me an email to GovRec at State Records, letting me know that you're having this technical glitch and we will get our systems administrator onto it ASAP. Thank you. Um, anybody else who's having a similar situation where they click create and it doesn't load the assessment form, please send us an email and we will get onto it for you. Thanks, Catherine, and thanks, Jill. Uh, Marianne has asked whether um, all questions have to be done in one sitting or can you save as you go? Um, Angela McGing has uh, responded to that that needs to be done in one sitting. Uh, and so we'll uh, add that to our enhancement list. Yes, as yes. Been suggested. <laughs> Thank so, you. Um, and uh, someone who hasn't identified themselves has asked about, is there a big change to the access directions? Yes. Uh, question, Catherine. Yes, uh, it is a big change. Mm -hmm. um, because of, yeah, so I, rather than just give you the five levels, you really do need to go and have a look at the maturity levels in the RMAT. Um, it reflects the changes to the legislation where the default position is now that any state record 20 years or older is open. So if you are looking at the previous access question uh, levels of maturity, you are not matching up with where it is for this year. So please go and download and look at the latest version of the RMAT because that will be the best way to um, assess where you're actually sitting. Great, thank you. Uh, look, I think that's all of the questions for you. So thank you, Catherine. Uh, thank you. We shall move on. Um, so next, I'll move on now to Christy Jabiri, who's our Senior Advisor at Agency Services on uh, amendments to the State Records Act and an update on those. Christy, over to you. Thank you, Martin, and good afternoon, everyone. All right, so I'm just doing a quick update for you on the amendments to the State Records Act that are um, administered by Museums of History, and they were the two changes that we had the transition period for last year. So the transition period has now ended, and those um, changes that we flagged, as Martin and Catherine have both mentioned, did come into effect on the 1st of January 2024 and are current now. So um, I know I spoke to a lot of you 
last year. I'd like to thank everybody for their action on access direction renewal and registration last year. It was a huge undertaking by everybody across the jurisdiction in New South Wales. 389 um, public officers were contacted and engaged with, and we have over 80% of coverage of the jurisdiction now who have taken steps to um, ensure that sensitive records um, remain closed to public access once they're 20 years old or older. So I'd really like to thank everybody for their efforts in that space. So the access directions are now, um, you do not need to register an open access direction anymore. You cannot register one. The default position is open, but you can continue to register early access notifications um, or closed. Um, and this year, for 2024, now transfer plans will be required. Okay, so yes, the Act changes um, for Part 6 became effective on the 1st of January 2024. Um, 390 public officers, um, access directions for more than 80% of the jurisdiction now. Um, and just a refresher for you all, although I'm sure you all know, the open access period has been reduced from 30 years to 20 years. Records that are 20 years old or older are open to public access by default and records that have sensitivities can be closed under a closed public access direction. Records that can be made avail immediately available to the public sooner than 20 years can be um, opened immediately under an early access notification. So our focus this year will be on the new requirement for transfer plans. Um, so there is a requirement for public officers to submit a transfer plan during 2024. You do have all year to do it. You'll notice that we haven't come out with a lot of communication around that because we are still waiting for the regulations to be published and um, there's an update about that in the state records part of the presentation later. I just want to let everybody know you only need to submit one plan from each public office. So we've had some people have a go at doing it in before the advice has come out and they've sort of done separate transfer plans for separate record sets. That's not the case. That's not what's required. So if I was from Museums of History, I would create one plan that spans um, the five years. So these plans will be active from 2024 to 2028. A new plan won't be required until 2029. Um, and in that one plan, I can add details about the records that I hold that are required as state archives in an approved retention and disposal authority. Um, I know I've sort of demonstrated the tool in the portal that we've had before, but we're just looking for a high description of high level description of the records, what sort of format they are, what sort of condition they're in, an estimate of the quantity and an estimate of when you're intending to transfer them or if you're intending to transfer them. Um, and we will be um, communicating with you once the state records regulations have been published and we will be coming out with um, resources to support you to submit a transfer plan as the year goes on. I have, I am happy to meet with people if they would like to have a chat about their transfer plan, if they're sort of keen to get started. Um, I already have been doing that with some agencies. But um, we're here, the agency services team at Museums of History um, can be contacted as always at transfer at mhnsw.au. And I think that's it from my presentation, but I expected that there may be some questions. Um, so I'm happy to take questions, Martin, if we have got questions on the board. Yeah, sure. So uh, one from uh, one of our attendees asking, is there a template or pro forma that's been developed to support agencies? So I think that's possibly answered easily. Yep, so there is, the tool's been built, it's on the portal. It is a tool that you can go in and start and then add to as you go throughout the year. Um, but we are working on a fact sheet that we're trying to get up quickly as an example. Um, we're going to do one for local government and just for um, other jurisdictions as well because we've been asked for that. So that's sort of in the works at the moment. Yeah, good, thank you. Uh, any other questions or comments from anyone? Uh, just to follow up, uh, there's a bit of a chat going on in the background. Um, the question, a uh, comment from Angela about the fact that the access directions were a bit of a surprise to see in the RMAT, uh, and will agencies be advised of any other changes in advance? 
Um, so Angela, as Catherine's responded to you, uh, the changes to RMAT reflect the changes in the State Records Act. Uh, so yes, there will be a change to RMAT uh, in relation to uh, next round in respect of transfer plans uh, that reflects that change in the State Records Act. Uh, but of course, uh, there's not often that there's change to legislation uh, and indeed, therefore, there won't be, uh, you know, any significant changes around RMAT uh, following that round, um, unless there's further changes to legislation. Um, part of the reason for that is that we're trying to establish baseline and comparative information uh, in order to be able to do that. Uh, the intention is for RMAT to remain fairly consistent um, from year to year. Uh, there might be some uh, minor changes uh, relating to non-legislative changes, uh, but the majority of them are covered by these two major changes to the State Records Act. Um, so that's the explanation on that one. Any other questions or comments on transfer plans? No? All right. Thank you very much, Christy. I'll now hand over to Stephen Powter, uh, Manager of State Records for a general update, uh, and indeed to Angela McGee, who's our other senior advisor, State Records. So over to you, both of you. Uh, this is a very um, quick update and I too am speaking from Gadigal land. Last year we consulted with everybody about additional classes to cover the disposal of identity verification records. The, the board recently approved those changes and they've been incorporated into GA28. Um, so they allow you to either hand back the identity verification documents and just create a record and keep that that they've been cited, or if you do need to keep a copy to dispose of it as soon as possible. Um, it's not meant to apply to law enforcement agencies or investigation agencies that have a good business reason to hold on to these identity verification documents. Um, it's GA28 has been updated and it's available on the website now. If you want to have a look, they're in customer service and under personnel recruitment. Um, next slide, Angela. The other thing I just wanted to point out to people also, this is on our main disposal authority page. We've created a big Excel spreadsheet which has all the public offices and small public offices and agencies by cluster with a link that every disposal authority um, they've been permitted to use and that has hyperlinks. So it's just a really easy way if you're confused to find out what disposal authority you can use. It includes all the general ones for where you're doing copying and migration projects and it also includes a link to the normal administrative practice guidelines. Um, this is a dynamic document. We have to change it every time there's a machinery of government change. Um, it gets changed after every board meeting because the disposal authorities change. Um, but it is being used by people to help them to do the RMAT. Um, it's being used by consultants. It's being used by museums of history as well. Because um, we understand that it is quite hard at times to find the relevant disposal authority. Um, if you do have a look at this and think there's something missing or something's wrong, then um, please get in contact with us at govrec at staterecords.nsw.gov.au. And that's it from me. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. Um, hi, everyone. Um, nice to meet you in this forum. Um, spoke to quite a few people last year when I was with Museums of History. New South Wales working with Christy on the Access Directions project, uh, but I'm in this role while Laura Baldwin is on leave at the moment. Um, just a few very quick updates uh, from me. So on the, the building the archives policy, uh, you've heard about uh, through a few different updates. Uh, there was consultation last year from May to June, um, which then led to the release of a consultation draft updated policy for feedback in October last year. You can see that um, draft and the report on consultation on our website. As you can see there, we had 185 submissions, uh, most of them through a, an online survey, um, but also through some uh, verbal feedback and by email. We've given uh, that current version of the updated policy 
to the board for initial consideration at the most recent board meeting. Um, but we had a new, we had some new appointments to the board, as you might have noticed from the announcement. Um, and we wanted to give them plenty of time to consider this fairly uh, significant foundation document for retention and disposal. Um, and following the conversation with the board in February, they asked us to do a little bit more targeted consultation with one or two parties, and it will go back to the board in April. Um, we're hopeful that the the updated policy will be approved at that meeting, and we'll be keeping you informed of that. Okay, so the next one is just a very quick reminder. If you've been reading for the record, uh, you'll have seen that uh, the satisfaction survey is still open. Um, it's been open for a while. We we're hoping to um, we've had some had a reasonable level of response, but um, the more the better to get a, a good understanding of what kind of issues people have with the, the way services are being provided both by State Records New South Wales and Museums of History New South Wales. That's a, a joint exercise. Um, it'll stay open until the end of this month, so we'd really encourage you to, um, to submit your response. It doesn't take too long, um, and the information is certainly very helpful for us. Um, the link to the survey is in the, the February edition of For the Record. And of course, if you have any questions, you can come to us through the usual GovRec email address. And uh, just very briefly on this, as, as Christy mentioned in, in her se section on um, the access directions, we've been working with Parliamentary Council's office on the remaking of the regulation. Uh, it's That work is still in progress. PCO busy people, as you all know. Um, uh, and I suppose the important thing to note is that in terms of um, the transfer plan requirements, what you can see in the tool that's available on the service portal already, it, it's live, um, it's, it's really, it's a prototype, but we're, we're not expecting a change from those requirements. The instructions we're giving to Parliamentary Council's office are very much in line with the requirements that you see in that tool. So um, it's a good guide in terms of that question earlier. What you see on the service portal at the moment is a good guide to what will be expected of you by the end of the year in a transfer plan. Um, and we'll keep working with Parliamentary Council's office to finalise the regulation. And of course, we'll be letting everyone know when, when that's actually become law. And I think that might be the end from me. Let's check. Indeed, great. Uh, you, are, you are Nostradamus. Uh, thank you very much, Stephen. Thank you also to Angela for those updates. Um, we just had one question about whether the draft regulation has been published. Uh, it's not quite ready for publication. Um, as Stephen mentioned, it's just going through um, PCO for drafting at this stage. Uh, so we will provide information to you all as soon as possible um, about the regulation. All right. Uh, are there any other last minute questions or comments before we close off today's forum? Opportunity going, going, gone. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for your comments uh, about uh, the, the session and our speakers. Uh, thank you, of course, to uh, our colleagues uh, at um, Dan at the Department of Customer Service, but thank you also to um, everyone from the team from State Records and Museums of History in New South Wales. And there's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes to make sure this runs quite smoothly, um, as well as the speakers. So thank you to everyone um, in the State Records team and MHNSW team who've been involved either front of house or behind the scenes uh, with this afternoon session. All right, we will be in contact with another Records Managers Forum date uh, very shortly and hope to see you there. Um, as always, if we can assist in any way um, with your work, uh, please do contact us. Uh, the forum also, of course, is a great opportunity for you to get to know and meet each other. So I hope that that has uh, been achieved a little this afternoon um, and that those connections and networks are being made. For now, thank you all very much. Bye-bye.